afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the May 16th meeting of the Rotary Club of Des Moines. I'm President Becky Greenwald. You know, we always start out our meetings with a few little factoids that some of us may have forgotten or didn't know or something that's changed about Rotary, our club, or Rotary International. So today we're going to talk a little bit about some international uh, scholarships that Rotary International puts together. So for more than a century, Rotarians have bridged cultures and connected continents through the more than 1.4 million members that we have worldwide. We're members of over 35,000 Rotary clubs around the world in over 200 countries and territories. And for our guests, I want you to know that the Rotary Club of Des Moines was the first Rotary Club to form in Iowa. And we're actually club number 27 out of those 35,000 clubs today. So we've got a long and rich tradition and heritage that we continue pushing forward into every new year. The uh, education has been at the forefront of our efforts here at the Rotary Club of Des Moines and with Rotary International. And each year in April, we honor scholars from the Des Moines uh, public schools. Uh, since the 1980s, our Rotary Club of Des Moines has invested more than $1 million in our local youth in these post-secondary scholarships. And just last month, we presented $8,000 scholarships to each of six graduating seniors from each of the six uh, Des Moines public high schools. And we also recognized the educators of the year, and also last month we recognized five educators who were nominated by their school principals, and each of those scholar uh, educators received a $1,500 stipend to use in their classrooms, and a little bit later this year you'll see billboards pop up with their likenesses on them. So we're always happy to be able to do that and recognize our, our uh, educators and how important it is in our community. But I think it's important that we know what Rotary International does as well. And, and Rotary has long been at the forefront of educational support and development through the scholarship programs that we have through the international organization. And that's funded through the foundation, which is our international group. And uh, uh, they have just transitioned in 2013 from the long-held uh, ambassadorial scholarships, which are graduate level scholarship grants, and now we have what we're called Global Grant Scholarships, and they fund graduate level coursework or research that is, is focused on one of the, the seven Rotary areas of interest. And it's always worth repeating what our areas of interest are with Rotary, and that's peace building and conflict prevention, disease prevention and treatment, water, sanitation and hygiene, maternal and child health, basic education and literacy, community economic development, and protecting our planet and its resources. So as Rotarians, everyone here can be proud to know that the money that you contribute each and every quarter that goes to our district and our Rotary International, as well as the money you contribute to our own Rotary Club of Des Moines Foundation, is what helps us support the future leaders uh, in some of these seven core focus areas that we uh, are concerned about with Rotary. And so now, with that, I'm going to invite Skeet to come up and share us with some words of wisdom, his moment of inspiration, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance and the Five Way Test. Skeet. Wow, that was, thank you, Bob. That, uh, that's a little overwhelming. Uh, when, uh, when you volunteer to do the uh, inspiration, Kitty is, always sends you a friendly reminder, capitalized in bold, <laughs> that you are scheduled to provide a, again, capitalized in bold, brief inspiration. <laughs> so today I will follow those instructions to the team. Very briefly, I hope you are all inspired. Thank you. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, not enough? Okay. Here's a pearl of wisdom from my 27-month-old grandson, Brooks. Do hard things. Be kind. Stay positive. Now, I hope you're inspired. <laughs> Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the five-way test. <laughs> is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill in 
better friendships will only be beneficial to all concerned. And is it final? Please greet your fellow Rotarians. seeing the crowd there. And today's table, table flies, I want to call your attention to the table flyers, and those are provided and sponsored by Christina Smith, and I want to thank Christina very much for her $50 donation to the Rotary Club of Des Moines Foundation, that's how that works. Thank you for making that donation, and others are always welcome to do, do that. If you're interested, just see Kitty ahead of time and we will make arrangements. Um, we're promote, Christina is promoting the Community Support Advocates, or CSA. They're having their grand opening at their new mental health clinic in West Des Moines. And please check out the flyer for details, but we're all invited to attend their grand opening, and that's going to be on Tuesday, June 25th, from 4 to 6 p.m. So check it out to see about the new services that are being offered in the community. And now I would like to ask Randy Worth, who's head of our Wheels Fellowship, to roll on up here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, President Becky. Next Wheels event kind of blend, bends between a fellowship and a, uh, an event, a service event, I guess. But it's uh, June 8th at 10 a.m. at Cat Dodge at the Gold Star Museum. Now, it's not that we can't go there on our own. This is special, the, uh, the 
president of their board is going to greet us. We will have a, a guided tour through the museum. But they also have a group of vehicles that are next door to the museum that I had not had not seen. Um, uh, just they have one of under 500 six by six wreckers, which uh, they're an interesting vehicle. Just to, you don't know what they're looking at for what they're for. Um, a 60 ton tank transport, a two and a half ton truck. Uh, think if you have ever watched Mash, you know, the trucks running around. That's <coughs> Um, plus they have artillery that's on wheels. Uh, the long range one is, has a range of 15 miles, and I'm sure there's new artillery that's farther than that, but I'm thinking 15 miles should be far enough. I don't know. Um, and personnel carriers and, and other things. I want a special thanks to Bill Jackson for helping me uh, set this up. Uh, it's a family friendly event, so bring your kids, grandkids, things like that, but make sure, adults, make sure you have a, a photo ID. It's kind of up to them whether they want to screen you or not. So anyway, uh, Saturday, June 8th at 10 o'clock. Thanks. Thanks, Randy. And now I'd like to invite our treasurer, Josh Brady, to come up. He's got a little announcement to make. Josh? Made it as a little better than Skeet, so I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, just a reminder on the survey, so you've seen a lot of survey uh, emails come across. You've seen, uh, hopefully this is your last announcement at the podium. Uh, but I want to just give you, a, open up with a little bit of a quote from Steve Jobs. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to truly, the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. So the point of the survey, uh, Tim and Kevin and myself over the next three years of your leadership have really tried to um, collectively hear from you so that we can make sure that we're providing you the membership that you want for being a good service to the community and that you love to be here and you love to be part of this, uh, this club. So our goal is to better serve you as our members uh, create more engagement opportunities so we can be better civic uh, servants for sure. Uh, attract new members. Of course, the sustainability of any club is the membership, so we must attract more members to stay vital. Expand how we can serve. So we want to hear from you on what are the things that interest you and make sure that we're fulfilling those, uh, those goals. And then growth. And when I say growth, not just numbers, not just membership numbers, but certainly uh, growth and your personal fulfillment, making sure that you're getting out of the club everything that you want, uh, growth as far as a greater community impact. So how as a club can we better impact the community in which we serve? And then obviously numbers we talked about. So to date, the data, we've got uh, roughly, I did mine this morning, so full disclosure, uh, we had 58, 59, now we're up to 60, I think mine counts now, 61. Just came in out of the press. So we've got 60, which is great input, but still that's only about a third of the surveys that have went out. So please, please, please encourage um, those that you see to complete the survey, even the people that are not here or not regular, regularly attend the lunch meetings. Those are the people we want to hear from. How do we get them back? How do we make sure that their voice is heard? How do we provide opportunities for them, even though they might not come to lunch meetings that frequently? So to do that, we're going to give an extension. So May 24th, it was tomorrow. Uh, we'll extend it to next Friday to try to get kind of a last rah-rah boost. Tim might be better at closing remarks than I, so hopefully we'll see if the data works or not. Let's go get some, uh, help me out here, guys. Let's get some more surveys coming in. Uh, those that have done it, we certainly appreciate your input. We certainly appreciate your time. Uh, encourage those to also participate. Uh, this is for you, this is for us, this is for our community. So thank you again for those that have done it. And we got one more week to try to finish strong. So appreciate it, thank you. Thank you very much. I know they put a lot of time and energy into that survey, so this is your chance to speak up. And now I'd like to invite Dave Busick up to introduce our guest speaker.
Thank you, President Becky. You know, my time as a journalist covering a lot of politics and my time now as a retired guy, I learned that there are a few things in politics uh, that are true. Uh, but one thing that I learned that is true is never bet against Connie Bozeman. <laughs> um, I don't know anyone who can say that they have more Des Moines DNA than, than Connie. She literally grew up on the state fairgrounds. Her dad, Kenny Falk, was the manager of the fair, and Connie lived in that uh, house there on the, uh, on the fairgrounds. She's a proud graduate of East High, and has been very active in the East High Alumni Association. She worked at Yonkers as a buyer for many years, serving 12 years on the Des Moines School Board? 14. 14, sorry, 14 years on the Des Moines School Board. In 2017, she decided she wanted to run for the city council, but there was an incumbent standing in her way, and she won to a four-year at-large term on the city council. She was re-elected in 2021. And then last year, she started eyeing the mayor's job. I thought it was a little crazy, uh, and I told her so, because I thought it was going to be a very tough election. But luckily, she didn't listen to me. And um, I should have listened to myself, which has never met against County Bozeman. Uh, not only does she have all these roots on the east side, but she also plugged into all of those roots up in my neck of the woods in northwest Moine, by marrying a Bozeman. Uh, they've only been up there for about 100 years. Um, I have seen firsthand how hard Connie works. Nobody works harder than she does come election time. She works the phones. She knocks on doors. She makes the calls. She raises money. You are as likely to see Connie in a business suit up here on this level meeting with the uh, Des Moines executives in the morning and then in the afternoon with jeans and a yellow vest on picking up litter along the side of the highway. She is equally comfortable in both settings. So I think it's really cool that here in Des Moines we have such strong female leadership in key roles. Angela Connolly at Polk County Supervisors. Let's see, there's somebody at Des Moines Schools. So oh yeah, yeah. Jack. <laughs> <laughs> and how about a warm rotary welcome for the first time in history, our female mayor, Connie Bowles. and I even have a family member I didn't know was coming. So don't have with me, Brian. Uh, uh, it really um, has been an honor and a pleasure to represent Des Moines as the mayor. And big shoes to fill. Frank County, after 20 years, led the city in some great renovation. And so I appreciate everything that you did for us in Des Moines. Um, I really I ran per, uh, for economic development and revitalization in neighborhoods. Uh, our successes in Des Moines are many, but we still have a lot of work to do. And both economic development and revitalization in neighborhoods lead to improvement in quality of life for our residents. And as the capital city, we need to lead the way, not only in the metro area, but really all the state. The issues we face are much the same as the rest of Iowa. We have older infrastructure and housing, and that takes a lot of investment and time to bring it back around. And in a in order to provide all the essential services, we must grow our base. Every piece of property in this city must provide value. We can't afford empty lots, we can't afford boarded up buildings, we can't afford nuisance properties, because that impacts our property values. So we put some things in place to help change that. And we, as we say, neighborhoods are our backbone. We have 49 neighborhood associations in Des Moines, and they actively participate in their neighborhood to make it better. So they're dedicated individuals who are trying to make a difference. We have uh, improving our neighborhoods, ION as we call it, is a program we put in place two years ago. We invested three and a half million into this program where over 4,000 structures were identified that they need help on the outside exterior. New roofs, new siding, new windows. We did pilot projects to start it to find out how the system would work. And there was a gentleman who was living in a house that had had a roof leak for four or five years. He had no plumbing. He went to Burger King, but he had water. Our group of people that are going out working door to door with people got him into senior housing and that house is coming down. Another lady was an elderly lady. Her gutter was coming down and it needed to be replaced. And she said, well, my husband passed away. I just couldn't do it. I uh, haven't had time to get in the ladder. Well, no, you're not supposed to get up on your ladder. Uh, so they got a contractor to get all the gutters replaced and got the help that she knit, needed. Uh, it is a true change for people. 
I've talked to a couple people who've gone through the process. So there's grants available based on income. It is for everyone in the city, but I say it's great for seniors who are on fixed income, but they can stay in their house, be safe, and then when they choose to sell, it will be in good condition. So again, this team is working with not only for the exterior, but they're working with other agencies to help people if they need help on the interior. So one way we're making a difference. The next thing is our block challenge grant. We started an Invest DSM, which we'll talk about. It was a program to challenge a neighborhood to do amenities on the outside of their house. So you could get five to 10 neighbors together, you get a thousand dollar matching grant, you get 10 to 19, you get $2,500 matching grant. It has been incredible. And you don't have to do, you put a mailbox on. But what we found, as you can see some of the pictures, the before and after, a lot of it's landscaping is for, again, the exterior curb appeal, but for every dollar invested by us, it's been four over for what people have put in on their own. Again, what we found, it wasn't about the improvements they necessarily made, people got to know their neighbors. Because you had to go find somebody that you could see from your front porch. So even though you could be two blocks down, because it goes all the way down, especially if you have 20 neighbors, if you can see them around, but people got together for the first time, talking to each other, they're having block parties now. And again, bringing neighborhoods together strengthens a neighborhood, which actually enhances safety too. So the other item that we have put a lot of money into, along with Polk County, so we can't thank Polk County enough, is Invest DSM. In 2017, uh, they did a study on what we could do to revitalize our neighborhoods. And we targeted four neighborhoods uh, within Des Moines, about 400 homes in each one. And you can see the house over on the left, which, sorry, you guys can't see too well. <laughs> was a house that was moved, it was great when uh, they were getting their health clinic. We literally moved this house to 31st and Cottage Grove. Totally redid it, it won an award for being redone, bringing it back to the historic significance. Again, keeping a house in the neighborhood with historical significance. The Blue House has an ADU unit. We teamed with AARP and Home Inc. It's the first ADU in, unit new housing built in Des Moines. Uh, it's an apartment off of the garage. Again, trying to maximize housing in a different way. That's up in Highland Park. <coughs> but for every dollar that was invested by Invest DSM, we've had a $7.66 return. It's been huge on turning around neighborhoods. We're actually expanding it now. We're going north of Grand and then over in Union Park. But again, strategies in place for loans, uh, forgivable loans if you stay in your home. There's all kinds of different mechanisms we're buying up lots, uh, taking down homes that were empty and boarded up, and putting up new homes. And I will have to say, in some of the areas, people go, you get that for a house? Yes, we can get that in Des Moines. It's a well-built home. People want to be close to the center of the city. And some of the, so we've seen some great turnarounds. And again, that's a collaboration with Polk County. And we are also asked having private investors, banks are coming in to help provide loans. Uh, especially in the Highland Park area. Again, it's other areas are the Southeast uh, 14th, that whole stretch, we're trying to reactivate it. We're South Ridge Mall, we have a new sports club going in Genesis, and they're putting pools and pickleball courts and all the amenities, uh, new businesses going in, apartments going in along there. Uh, again, another great way to help rebuild an area that needs, uh, I say some tender loving attention. Uh, Sixth Avenue is our next corridor. It was designated as a main street, um, and it's just been incredible what's been going on, because it's really going all the way down through Highland Park now. So again, some of the things, the center on six, where there's gonna be an incubator, the bus, the artwork that's being done on the bus stations, uh, and then uh, going further up into Highland Park, I think everybody's, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but if you haven't been to Highland Park, you need to get there. The renovation of the Chucks and the Highland Park Bakery and the Slow Down Coffee and tons of businesses opening up, taking old buildings that were empty and some of them in really terrible condition and making it new again. It's similar to what you saw happened in the East Village. It is happening in the Highland Park area and I think has great potential. Uh, there were some of our other fun things we get to do is rebuild birds. <laughs> Sorry if the inconvenience, but when 
I know Frank heard about potholes a lot. I heard about potholes, so I don't want anybody to complain about a road that's going to be stuck. Uh, Second Avenue reconstruction, total rebuild. Again, some of the things we have to do as an older city is rebuild and refurbish, and it takes a lot of money. So the next item is our local option sales tax. As we all know, it's for property tax relief, but it has really been the impetus for us to do a lot of the projects that we had to defer. Uh, it has given us for street improvements, flood mitigation, neighborhood improvements, public safety, and expanded hours at the library. So it was critical, and we appreciate all of you supporting it, whoever voted for it. Uh, it's been a game changer for us. And some of the things that, like the closest creek, you, Glory Hoffman, I don't know how many people know her, um, she is now 95 years old. Her house got flooded in 2018. Her husband was on a committee for a stormwater basin to correct the area around 41st down by Snookies. And she had five feet of water in 2018. Makoka the Drive all got hit. There was a 1930 wooden storm uh, sewer there. Uh, it was interesting. But anyway, we moved it up five years because of the sales tax and the need because of the flood we had in 2018. Uh, she now has a retention basin named after she and her husband, Lyle and Gloria Hoffman. I don't know if anybody would like to have a retention, but she was thrilled. <laughs> because she said, and when I said, Gloria, we finally got it done, she goes, well, it was about time, kind of. <laughs> and that would be Gloria. But again, because of input from our community, we started a whole stormwater committee. And now they have reanalyzed all the watersheds and what should be the priority but it was people like Gloria that made the difference, who said, you guys need to do more, and we did step forward and do it. So when we talk about public safety, it's how did we do public safety different. This is our care program, our crisis advocacy response effort, and really what it is dealing with the mental health calls. Uh, we have a whole team, uh, Lorna Garcia is a sergeant, she is phenomenal. They've been doing this for years, but because of the additional dollars we got for sales tax, We've been able to expand it and work with broad lawns. We now have 24 seven care. Uh, and so do you send a police officer out or do you send both crisis team and police officer? And it is, they've taken thousands of calls already. Again, trying to get people the help they need. And if a police officer does go out with a crisis team, they might say, okay, I only need to be here to make sure it's safe. Then they leave so they can go do the other things. But it's been a true game changer and again, Collaborating with Polk County, Broadlands Medical Center on providing that has been huge. We have even embedded into our call 911. If it's deemed a mental health call, it gets transferred over to somebody who specializes in mental health calls to walk through what do you need, what can we do, and see if it really needs a police intervention or if it needs a mental health crisis team. The other thing that we're doing within our fire department is a mobile integrated uh, health care. Uh, they are doing phenomenal work. They've assigned officers. We, I guess we have frequent callers that call in 911, and it could be because they didn't take their medicine. Just issues that they're the same callers over and over, so when they call, ambulances had to go out. So what they're doing now, they have the list of the names. They're going out and meeting with them to determine what they need. <laughs> what is it that you need to make sure you need trips to your doctor's office? Because that's what they called for, too. So again, trying to figure out how we do public safety in a more meaningful way to deal with what people's goals are. The other thing they've added is at Central Iowa Shelter. I don't know if you know where the downtown fire department is to the shelter, maybe 500 feet. If they got a call from, they have to send the ambulance down. So they have integrated uh, fire medics into the shelter and they're doing vitals and they reduce it by 70%. Again, getting the people the help they need and the care they need without having to go with an ambulance and the expense of that. Again, looking at things a little bit differently. And we have new fire stations going in. This is on the northeast side of Des Moines. Uh, again, knowing that we needed to cover that area of the city in a better way. Uh, they're replacing the one on 9th and University. And it'll be about MLK and uh, by King Elementary with a new fire station. Again, more up-to-date fire station, separation of the trucks and where the people stay, the firemen stay, and uh, again, uh, different amenities that we keep 
to make sure that we provide the safety that we need to for the residents. Another thing we're teaming with Polk County is a sobering center. It's going in across from the Polk County Health Department on Carpenter. <coughs> and this is meant so if somebody is picked up, instead of taking you directly to jail, if you're walking and you're intoxicated or high or whatever, you'll go to a sobering center. And it's gonna have limited beds and you will get where you have to get sober and then someone will have to come get you. But they'll also try to do some triage and say, what treatment do you need? Again, you get taken to jail, you have to post bail, you have to do all those things, and it just leads to terrible outcomes for many people when you really need help. So that should be opened in August. And within that space on the other side is Broadlands Mental Health Crisis Team will be also there. And there will be a, a center for welcoming center, I can't remember the name, but for immigrants and refugees. So that once you've been here for maybe a year or two years, you still need help. You still need how to navigate the system. So they'll have people there to navigate and help people get through that. Again, trying to get the people the help they need. One thing we've added because of, you know, for pure safety is downtown's a huge neighborhood. There's like 17,000 people living down here. So we've added more uh, dedicated police force to the downtown area. Uh, they will be housed in the nationwide building, uh, which we will soon be taking over, but they'll set up an office. Uh, to give you an example, we have people that like to drag race downtown, scoot the loop. I kind of thought maybe after how many years people had something better to do. Um, so they have a true dedicated team to try to alleviate because they're parking on the side streets, they're dragging, and they gave 500 tickets in one week. So I think uh, hopefully we'll eradicate some of that behavior uh, because they're not going away. It's not a one and done, uh, but that's how many people are down. And many of them are young adults from outside Des Moines. And uh, yeah, it's been interesting. So we've added a complete force and also to then walk the skywalks more often and be more engaged. So. Again, the partnership has a whole downtown master plan. Uh, we were a part of it and how we can really improve um, the skywalk system and how we can improve what's going on downtown because we're the vibrant hub. Uh, if anybody was here this last weekend, you know, with the MJ musical, it was packed, it was sold out. I, every show was sold out. I just came from, oh, by the way, Greg Edwards says hello. Uh, I came from my uh, Catch DSM uh, meeting and the amount of kids on those teeter-totters, which is a place-making uh, that has been brought in with the Civic Center was incredible. Kids playing in the water, spray grounds, and every teeter-totter was full. Now, I've seen them with a lot of adults full too, so it's great to see the kids. <laughs> so again, trying to figure out what are the tools we need to keep Des Moines moving forward. And so we do have some challenges. We had some businesses leave. Uh, they decided to close up quite a few buildings. But what we're seeing is um, opportunity. And I always say that the challenge becomes opportunity. We're seeing more people uh, convert buildings into residential. Uh, things like the financial center was gonna be a hotel, now it's gonna be residential. And we're finding that, you know, we're finding a mix of people who wanna live downtown. It's people my age, it's a young people, it's people, you know, so it's a great mix. And I think that we have great opportunity to convert some of our buildings. It's much easier to convert the older buildings into housing than it is maybe the big floor plan. So we're seeing that the two run center and the financial center <laughs> too that are being done. And I've heard that there's options now for some of the Wells Fargo's building. I'm sure everyone's heard. We're uh, moving to the other nationwide building. We'll be able to move all of our city offices in one location. Uh, it is a huge opportunity. We had the armory and then we were gonna build across the street from City Hall, and that building alone was gonna be 36 million. Our IT is in the armory where there's windows, and it's kinda of close to the river, so there's ever an issue. Uh, so this gives us an opportunity. I know uh, the Civic Center has asked about interest in the armory to make it for classes and performance. Uh, City Hall, we will keep very <laughs> tight under what it will be because it's a historic building and then move, even the police department will be moving to the nationwide. And that police department, the older building will become open, which offers great opportunity even that whole market district that is being renovated. So we looked at this whole 
really the river could be a great cultural center for Des Moines and adding new amenities. So by the numbers, record growth downtown, 513 million in investment in 2023. So Des Moines is alive, Des Moines is busy, and uh, we are gonna continue with more downtown housing. I think there's close to 900 units, if I added them all up, going in between the East Village, over by the Central Iowa Shelter, uh, so, and the Gray Station is still increasing. So a lot of availability for opportunity if anybody wants to move to the city of Des Moines. Again, it's um, great to see. Uh, I know on the one in the East Village, uh, they're doing with poured concrete. So that building, those buildings are not going anywhere. It's Mike Whelan's project. So it's uh, pretty exciting to see people doing creative things. And I kind of said when I ran, uh, we need to roll out the red carpet and we want businesses to come downtown. And we just had an announcement of a major company coming downtown. Uh, so it's exciting to see that they wanted the vibrancy of an urban setting. And we're hoping more people, because with more density, then it helps with our transportation issues. If you have more people along the corridors, if you, you makes more sense for the bus routes. And so we are open to work with everybody that we can. Uh, one thing we did add in the under small businesses, we've been told we're a little difficult sometimes on our permitting and things like that. Uh, I think we're not as difficult as some people might say, but the small business especially, you really don't know what you don't know. And when you would go in, you would have to go from one person to another person. So we have hired two people in economic development to shepherd people through the process. Because when you're opening your business, every day you're not opening is a day you're not doing business. And uh, so we're already finding that's been very helpful for some of the small businesses. You know, I opened up a small business. I, I do the fair, but I did have a store one time and you're the master of everything. So it gets complicated when you, all the other nuances, if you have to trigger something, you have to plant trees and put iron fencing and all that. So anyway, we're pretty proud about able to have people to help small businesses get open. And one of the great things, we finally got the grant for the Southeast Connector, a $34 million grant that will connect straight out MLK on the Southeast side, past Kemen, past East 30th to the US 65. A great connection for the Eastern Hill County. Uh, that, along with the fact that it'd be great to connect, but it opens up tons of opportunity for land in that area that would never have been developed. And so it'll be great for people wanting to go to the fair, but it'll also great. Uh, DART is putting their uh, new facility out there. Uh, and so then that will open up the space in Gray Station. So again, it's just kind of a catapult of opportunity. And then our airport, we all know how vital that is. We are all probably seeing the growth now. This will be critical to opening more gates to get more people in. It helps on our conventions and visitors coming into our city and even for us going out, there'll be a lot more flights. So again, it's a $752 million project, just a small change. Um, but again, it is a critical thing for Des Moines. And then we go into the market district redevelopment, which is off of the East Village. Again, great opportunity. Uh, and now with the police station opening up, that offers up a lot more land and more opportunities. So again, still a lot of land to develop in Des Moines and uh, we're gonna keep moving on it. So one of the things we're really proud of is our park system. I think when Frank was on, the goal was to have a park or a green space within a 10 minute walk. And we currently have 75 parks, 81 miles of paved and unpaved trails, seven cemeteries, two community recreation centers, three golf courses, four golf courses, uh, 25 aquatic facilities, 58 playgrounds, three dog parks, one skate park, come on BMX park, that's just a few. So uh, again, a lot of opportunity in creating more park space over on the four mile watershed. We've teamed with Polk County and there'll be a complete park from like Euclid all the way up to Sleepy Hollow almost. One of our projects too is the Birdland Park. There is a plan uh, to renovate all that whole Birdland Park. We just need to find 52 million, but other than that, no problem. <laughs> Again, the other is Grays, uh, Grays Lake. What can you say about that? I mean, it's the projects that we're doing there uh, and keeping that refurbished and the growth in that area has been tremendous and people do love the Grays Lake area. 
Uh, one thing we're really proud of is the Reichardt Northside Community Center. Uh, that will be, uh, they're getting all the plans finalized and they have listened to the community in no other way. I, I said that they were even asking which color palettes they like the best. Uh, but it truly will be a community center and it replaces the old Grub Y uh, with good meeting space, uh, great gyms, and will be a great asset for that area in that whole north side of town. Along with Riverview, what's gone on, and uh, there's talk, NDC took over the Des Moines Cold Storage old building and that came down. So again, that whole section of town is seeing great growth. So that's kind of what's happening in Des Moines. I guess I'll open it up for questions, uh, but I can't thank groups like this enough to bring people together. So it gives us an opportunity to talk about what's going on. Like I said, we have great things going on, still have a lot of work, but I know that we can do great things in Des Moines and continue the progress that's been made. And I know that I see Jackie here, since I was on school board for about 14 years, uh, working closely with the Des Moines schools too. Uh, we're going to have a joint meeting in June to just talk about how we can work together and what are your issues, what are our issues, and how we can build up the neighborhoods because a great school strengthens every neighborhood too. So it's a critical factor. So any questions, I guess. Well, thanks for the presentation today. Do you have an update on the future of the Pro Iowa Soccer Stadium in Des Moines? They're still short. Some dollars. <laughs> uh, so we do not have an update yet. I don't think it's that far, but we know what we are able to do, and I think it's up to Pro Iowa and that group to decide what, I don't know if they're waiting for state, maybe some more dollars or whatever. Again, it's a great amenity for that area. Uh, I don't know where they're, you know, we'll see. Do you have a timetable for when the police department, some of those other folks, will be moving over to Nationwide? It's like 25, another year. And police will even be alert further because they have to do a lot of um, safety to uh, make sure when you have the police department by you. But again, you'll have a whole police force downtown, right in the middle of downtown. So I think they have to close off a section of Walnut because they need to be able to get to their vehicles. But uh, again, with Nationwide came a complete parking ramp. So it'll be the first time for maybe some of their vehicles not to have to be scraped because they're out in the open all the time. So again, it's an amenity that will be great for them. As somebody who lives downtown and tries to walk everywhere, I'd just like to say I appreciate some of the walking safety things that have been done and extending the sidewalks you know, out into the street right. a little bit. And some of the one-way streets going two ways, which slows down everybody. And I would just say continue doing that because there's, there's still a need to make it safer for walkers downtown. Yeah, thank you. It, it, the number one thing I hear in every meeting is speed. I, it's like people are going 70 miles an hour on the side street. I'm like, really? Uh, there's a man who's had 10 cars in his yard. So they're putting the traffic calming. So I just tell everybody, obey the speed, slow down. You're, and, and be attentive to what, you know, walkers and bikers and who are there. So again, uh, the grand locus, I don't know if we're gonna do two-way conversion all the way up, but we'll have a dedicated bike lane up grand. Uh, so it'll be safer, uh, but the difference of cost of doing that is like five million. Uh, so you, you just think you're just switching roads, but you got to do stoplights and paint and all kinds of things. So I haven't have heard DMAC mention uh, downtown urban campus. Are you working with them? Uh, yes, I. You know, we're working with all. The, I'm meeting with all. I saw actually Ms. Um, Rob Denson went on the DC trip and what we can do to collaborate along with Grandview and Drake too because all of the educational groups are strong partners in Des Moines so they bring people in and create the vibrancy and hopefully we'll keep their graduates so again you know because the new building the up in the urban campus that building's used all the time for meetings it's a great addition and I know that I think they're I don't know what their enrollment is but I think their enrollment's going up too. Uh, so again, trying to retain talent and keep the young people, if they come in or even they go out and get them back in, we all know that that's one of the big things for employers is retain the talent of what we have. And it's every, I was at an economic development uh, meeting 
in Cedar Rapids yesterday, that was the number one focus, is getting people into Des Moines or Cedar Rapids or Iowa. Is there an active plan uh, still for uh, recreation? Uh, uh, rivers being changed for recreational activities? I should not have forgot the Icon Water Trails. <laughs> yes, there's a major. We're already starting. You'll see that over by uh, Gray's Lake, there will be that will be the first section of like Rapids. And then Scott Avenue, that work is being done. And then Harriet Street is where the boat <coughs> ramp to get out. Uh, so it's still being done. But the Center Street Dam, which is critical to the safety of everyone going down and where that big project is, is still got a ways to go, I think, to get the funding. But they're doing things up at Prospect Park. So the water, Icon Water Trails, I think, is a great amenity. It will be, uh, it's actually helping talk about water quality because it's bringing the issue up but if you're going to be in the water you want it you want it to be a little higher quality so it's really twofold is it'll be recreation and but it's also to help ensure that we improve our water quality so a lot of work's been done with Polk County on watersheds upstream to try to make sure that we again make our water safety a priority uh, but the water you know I think we've heard so much and so it's just now coming to fruition when you see it uh, I'd love to see the Center Street Dam out and have the rapids going through because if you see what happened to the skate park, I can only imagine what it'll be on the water trails. Honey, you know uh, well that it took the Martin Waterworks well over a decade to negotiate with regional entities and the governments of uh, the production of water. So we've got that done, but it took a lot of work and support from people like you to get that done. Did that sharing of resources, the sharing of risks, It's difficult, and you now I'm facing we're facing that with DART, to be quite honest. Because if you have to adjust, everybody wants to justify the service you get, and it isn't all equal. But what is equity? And uh, for the good of the total region, I think we need to start thinking more regionally than individually, and that goes for us too. Yeah, we're the big guy because we're the biggest city, but we should want everybody to be successful and provide for the people who need it whether it be homeless whether it be dark whether it be all the other social services but like water that you it did it take i said everything takes time and money it seems like uh it's nothing's easy but i think we have to have really some serious conversations and i've asked that we change our mac group which is the metro uh, coalition of councils that we take four items homeless uh, what water is kind of solved right now with the homeless, the dark, and some of the bigger issues we're facing as a metro region, and really try to tackle those in a way that we have grand conversations. It's not about us against them. It shouldn't be that. We should be working together because it all impacts. We know we have workers that live in Des Moines because we have affordable housing that take an hour <coughs> to get out to some of the other communities to work. So numbers in your own community might not be as great but we're people are coming all over to go get around and it takes like an hour i talked to a young woman who is a student at drake and she's out at jordan creek over an hour to get there well if it's going to take that long yeah she doesn't have a car because she's a student but if you had a car would you take mass transit so that's why we need some effective studies to find out how can we do it better if we're going to pay more i think we need to figure out and that's why we entered into with, um, it's a system of microtransit called VIA to understand on the fixed routes, are they in the right place? I mean, DART is, they're very efficient for what they do, but we have a, a metro-wide system that was never built for mass transit. So they're, you know, and then you have communities that say, well, I'm out in 18 months, I can be out. We can't run a system where you're being threatened all the time by I'm gonna be in or I'm gonna be out. How do you build it? So. Again, to the I, waterworks, yes, it took a while, but I think it's a, a model that we can use on other things. Connie, keep in mind, Rotary, and I would say this to some of some of our colleagues here, to our future leaders who have the survey out right now. There are Rotary clubs in all those suburbs. Most of the business people, a lot of not-for-profits, are represented. Education, nice cross section, a lot of young. Maybe. 
maybe we could be of help on that last topic. <laughs> downtown is right. for Urban Day, you know, or, or whatever. Keep that in mind. Let's all think about that. Right? Well, I think whatever we can do as a business community, as a community groups, or whatever, to bring people together. Again, it's not we're one metro area and we're stronger together. So, uh, and I get we're all after development, we're all after, but there's enough to go around. And, uh, you know, when it comes to affordable housing, how do we bridge the gap between all areas having affordable? We know we're short, so do every community say, I'm gonna try to get this many in my area? Uh, you know, so again, it, it's ongoing conversations. It's being open-minded and saying, let's look for the total good. So you've been mayor about four or five months. Uh, what has surprised you and how has your life changed? Busier, <laughs> Frank can probably attest. A lot of meetings, coming out and speaking. Uh, it's interesting because I represent the city. I, same population, same vote, and it's uh, the mayor, you get asked to come to a lot more. Uh, and what's interesting is the willingness of everybody to roll up their sleeve and do work. You know, from staff, they've been great. Uh, you know, anytime you have a transition, it's everybody's been very welcoming and opening. And it's been, like I said, it's been a privilege to be able to come out and talk about Des Moines. I'm proud of Des Moines. I, like I said, I put a lot of time and energy to make this city better from starting with school board because I believe schools were critical to a city success and then ran for city council because cities helped determine what schools were gonna be. It all is intertwined and it's, so it's been great. And I really support of everyone, every place I go. Uh, I think my TV commercials did a little too good because I'm, every place I go, somebody goes, oh, you're the mayor. So uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's been a, actually it's been fun. Uh, yeah, have we had challenges? Because I went, I was asked, whoever won was gonna go to a class is a Bloomberg Philanthropy put on a new mayor's class, and there were 27 of us. So from Des Moines to Chicago to Philadelphia to Ogden, Utah, and that was the first 100 days. And I luckily had nothing major happen in those first 100 days compared to some cities, except my city manager saying he might resign, which he did resign, but he's back. So uh, that was not good news. Uh, but Scott has decided to stay, and uh, I think we're fortunate because he's a strong leader. But uh, yeah, it's, it's like really what can come up has been interesting when you hear, because we're all in a group chat, all the mayors that went together, and I think one person had a shooting in his city, somebody else had a tornado, <coughs> somebody else had, and I'm like, okay, minor, minor things for us. But you have to be prepared, that you never know what's gonna happen. And that's just uh, one of the things that uh, you find in, in this world that you get contacted first. So again, um, you know, I think it's been good. I think we have a great city. We have great leaders that have paved the way uh, and we're gonna continue uh, to make Des Moines the best that it can be. So any other questions? Time, I see him by the box. <laughs> part of the Rotary Rosie Reader Band. So back in 2020, our club donated $40,000 to the uh, Public Library Foundation for that band. And now I have a very special announcement. And I am so honored. Would you come back up here, please, honey? I'm so honored to welcome Des Moines Mayor Connie Bozen as an honorary member of the Rotary Club of Des Moines, continuing a longtime tradition we recognize the mayor's commitment to community service and leadership and for demonstrating a deep dedication to improving the lives of Des Moines residents. You are embodying the Rotary core values of service above self. So let's welcome you to the Rotary Club of Des Moines. Thank you. Thank you. Remember 
that you can bring guests you would like to come along. You just have to RVSP with uh, Kitty at 9 a.m. the Wednesday before so that we know they're coming. Think about someone who you'd like to invite to Rotary that would enjoy one of our upcoming speakers and perhaps make a great addition to our club. So next week, May 23rd, we're going to have former Iowa First Lady Christy Vilsack and Captain Doug McGray talking to us about the USS Iowa. On May 30th, our International Service Committee is going to have a wonderful program with some members of the Ames Rotary Club to join us. And on June 6th, Myrna Johnson with Iowa Public Radio. So, thank you all, as always, for being a member of our vital Rotary Club of Des Moines. We're happy that you've joined us here today, where our club means business. So until we meet again, let's get out there and have some fun and do good in the name of Rotary. We are adjourned. <laughs>